The Battle of Jericho takes place in the book of Joshua in the Bible, Joshua being a man who would become the leader of the Israelite tribes after the death of Moses, and a man who would oversee the Israelites in their conquest over Canaan. The tale essentially sees the newly appointed leader take the Israelites to the city of Jericho, a well-fortified city which stands in what would become their territory. Jericho was once considered to be impenetrable, certainly not the type of settlement that could easily be overcome by the Israelites, regardless of how many swarmed it. While the military might of the city is not documented in the book of Joshua, we can safely assume that at this point, Jericho is not concerned about invaders, and that any who tried would not be successful. The tale serves to show believers that belief in God can allow one to achieve any heights, and that tasks that seem impossible to complete can be overcome if they walk with God. We see from the very first chapter that Joshua gains the allegiance of the people having been a servant to Moses himself, and that God declares to him that no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It becomes clear that God's intentions for Joshua is for him to carry on Moses' work and to lead the Israelites to inherit the land that had been sworn to their ancestors. In Joshua 1.10, Joshua tells his people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. The people are in complete support of Joshua, as we see at the end of the chapter, where they declare that they will do whatever it is he tells them, and that those who disagree or disobey will be put to death. In chapter 2, Joshua begins his conquest of the land of Canaan by sending two spies to scout the terrain. However, he asks his spies to focus their efforts on Jericho, implying that Jericho is of great interest to him, or that Jericho poses the most threat and so should be given extra consideration. The spies agree and enter Jericho without any real intention in mind. The nature of their spying nor their objectives are ever detailed, but we are told that they end up housed by a prostitute named Rahab. The king of Jericho is then informed that the Israelite spies have entered the city and are now staying with the prostitute, Rahab. Again, we are not told how the spies were compromised so quickly, but one might say it became obvious by their appearance or that they looked weary from the road. The fact that the king is alerted at all, however, shows us that Jericho's monarchy was aware of the Israelites and may have been even weary of them, given that he wants them seized immediately. The king of Jericho wastes no time and sends a message to Rahab to present the spies who had entered her home, as they are enemies of the state. But Rahab tells that she didn't know where the spies had come from, and certainly didn't know where they were now. She said that they had come to her, but that they had left through the city gate in the night, and didn't tell her where they were going. She then gives the king false hope, telling him that if he and his men are quick, they can still catch them. In actuality though, we are told that Rahab hid the spies on the roof of her home, and were safe there that night, as the king and his men went off to chase shadows. Rahab then went to the spies on her roof, and revealed to them that while she lives in Jericho, she understood that the word of the Lord of the Israelites was true. She says in Joshua 2, 8 through 9, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Here she also confirms that those in Jericho live in fear of the Israelites and their God, and also continues to list a few of their exploits that had left the city melting with fear. Having shown kindness to the spies by shielding them from their pursuers, Rahab asked the spies for kindness in return, and asked for the lives of her, her father, her mother, her siblings, and all those who belong to them, from being spared from death, for she knows that with their god on their side, the city of Jericho will fall. The men tell her in 2.14, Our lives for your lives. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. She then does them a further kindness and helps them escape through the window of her home by use of a rope. We are also told here that Rahab's home was actually a part of the city wall, so when the spies left through the window, 
They landed just outside of Jericho and were safe to fight Egress on the hills nearby. It's here the spies clarify their arrangement with Rahab and tell her in 217 through 20, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father, mother, and your brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in your house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Rahab agrees to these terms. The spies then return to Joshua once the coast is clear and explain to him everything that has happened. The next morning, we see the Israelites attempt to cross the River Jordan. It is understood that in the river, they will come across the Ark of the Covenant, a legendary golden chest that is most commonly known for holding tablets with the Ten Commandments engraved on them, and it will be carried by the Levitical priests. The officers amongst the Israelites command everyone to follow the priests, but not to get too close to the Covenant. It is understood that in doing this, the Israelites would be guided to their destination. God then proceeds to give a few commands to Joshua. He tells them to tell the priests, when they find them, to take the Ark of the Covenant and go onwards ahead of them. He also tells them that when they reach the edge of the Jordan waters, to go stand in the river. Joshua relays this message to the people, and promises that God will deliver them all glory. He ensures that their crossing over the Jordan River and there beyond will be successful, where in Joshua 3.13, he says, And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. When the Israelites made their way to cross the Jordan, they spotted the priests who Joshua had sent ahead of them. The passage here tells us that at this point in time, the Jordan was at flood stage during the harvest, but that as soon as the priests who were carrying the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. The Bible tells us in Joshua 3, 16 through 17, it piled up in a heap a great distance away, at a town called Adam, in the vicinity of Zerthan, while the water flowing down the Sea of the Arabah, that is, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. The next chapter sees Joshua and the Israelites rejoice, having crossed the Jordan. God speaks to Joshua and tells him to take twelve stones from the river, each stone to represent the twelve tribes of the Israelites, so that future generations might remember what took place here, and that they may always be aware of the power of God, that he can even stop the waters should he choose to. Joshua would end up taking these rocks to the eastern border of Jericho, known as Gilgal. And there the Bible tells us the stones stand to this day, a memorial to Joshua and the Israelites. Here the Bible tells us that there were 40,000 Israelites ready for battle as they stepped onto the plains of Jericho. Joshua then called the priests out of the water, and when they stepped onto dry land, the waters which had been frozen by their presence under God's command flowed once more returning to their natural flooded state. Chapter 5 is mainly dedicated to the Israelites being circumcised under the command of God, as well as the celebrating of Passover and detailing the sustenance that they consumed as they fed on the produce of Canaan. The beginning of the chapter though tells us that when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. This echoes what Rahab had told the spies, that all the land had heard about the exploits of God and all the impossible things he had done. Hearing of the river being stalled so that the Israelites could cross may have been the nail in the coffin that sent the surrounding civilizations into fits of panic. The Israelites, after all, were only getting closer, and it seemed that not even the Jordan River 
could stall them for what was shaping up to be a complete invasion. By 513, Joshua and the Israelites are nearing Jericho, but it is here they are met by a surprising entity. The Bible describes this being as a man with a sword in his hand, to which Joshua asks him, are you here for our enemies, or are you here for us? The man answers, neither, and proceeds to tell Joshua that he's the commander of the army of the Lord, and that he has come to deliver a message. Who this man is, is never really revealed, but there are those that believe this to be an angel, or possibly even one of the archangels. In any case, Joshua recognises that the being is of God's allegiance, and throws himself before the man on hands and knees. This commander then relays God's message to Joshua, telling him in 5.15, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. It might seem like an odd request, but the idea was that it would demonstrate God's presence. God himself was now in the midst of Jericho, beside Joshua as he said he would be, and so the land itself had now been blessed by the Lord. By this, it would have been disrespectful to tread upon the now holy land that God now inhabited with the soles of one's footwear, and so Joshua was asked to remove them. By chapter 6, we are told that the gates of Jericho were securely barred, and that no one went in or out. Evidently, Jericho was expecting the Israelites, and were also clearly concerned by their presence that their city had been placed on lockdown. God then tells Joshua in 6, 2 through 5, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And so Joshua did exactly as the Lord commanded, sending the army to march around the city walls, with the priests following behind, blowing their trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant in tow. Joshua also commands his men to do this in silence, with the exception of the priests, who were blowing their trumpets. He tells his army not to give a war cry, not to raise their voices, and not to say a single word until he has given permission to do so. Those living in Jericho would have likely feared the worst, and braced themselves for a battle, as 40,000 men paced their way around their stronghold in a show of silent strength. They would have likely have been baffled though, because after encircling the city, Joshua did not give a single command, and instead, returned to his camp that night. By the next morning, Joshua repeated the exact same routine, and the Bible tells us he did this for a whole six days. But on the seventh day, Joshua changed his routine slightly, marching around the camp seven times as opposed to the usual six. Those in Jericho would have been used to seeing this by now, and probably watched in both confusion and dread as the ominous silent force, if not for the trumpets and the sound of marching footfalls, meandered its way around them yet again. On the seventh rotation though, Joshua beckoned at the top of his voice. Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. The trumpet sounded off and the army made a unified bellow against Jericho. With that, the walls of the city immediately collapsed and the Israelites stormed in as one, slaughtering men, women and children as they took the city for their own. Joshua kept to the promise his spies had made to Rahab, as he is seen instructing the spies to get Rahab and her family to safety. She and her family are actually detailed as becoming a part of the Israelites, because of the kindness she had originally shown. The Israelites then burn the entire city and everything inside of it, but it's imperative to note that they took all the articles of gold, silver, iron and bronze, 
and placed it in the treasury of the Lord's house, which we'll talk about later. Subsequently, Joshua proceeds to curse anyone who tries to rebuild Jericho, claiming in 626, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. Some may question why Joshua chose to set this curse at all, and there are a few ways to answer this. Firstly, we understand that Jericho was a city that worshipped other gods, or pagan gods, as they are often referred to as. The worshipping of other gods or idols appears to be a great sin, given that the punishment for such an act usually results in complete destruction. You might say that Joshua puts this curse in place not to spite he who attempts to rebuild Jericho, but to warn him and to prevent him from rebuilding something that might fall into old habits and receive total destruction once more at the command of the Lord. Joshua is also putting this curse in place to express his love for God, ensuring that he does everything in his power to stop the worshipping of what was deemed as false gods. By using a curse, he can ensure that such blasphemous behaviour will not be repeated, even after his death when he is not physically there to stop it. Furthermore, the destruction of Jericho would no doubt have sent ripples across the plains to all surrounding settlements. Jericho, being one of the largest of these settlements, crumbled without much effort on behalf of the Israelites, and so it would have no doubt had others in the area struck with awe and terror. It would also make them far likely to concede to the Israelites, who had such a powerful god on their side. But Joshua's curse would only further exemplify this, and would serve as a warning not to just anyone trying to rebuild Jericho, but also to anyone else who thought about standing against them. Lastly, the curse would also work to protect the Israelites against the supposed negative effects of the city. While these aren't necessarily detailed of Jericho, besides being a city that worshipped the wrong god, some believe that the sins of Jericho and the related cities could spread upon those who were not truly devoted to God. We see a potential example of this in chapter 7 of Joshua, where an Israelite known as Achan steals plunder from the battle. As noted in 619, Joshua decrees that all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. While many agree Achan is at fault here and should accept full responsibility for his sin of stealing, some see Jericho as a problem too, that the items within its walls and the features about the city gave birth to temptation. By placing a curse to stop it from ever being rebuilt again, Joshua would be preventing such cases like these from ever cropping up again. What's interesting is that the curse is actually fulfilled many years later, during the reign of King Ahab. In the Book of Kings, we are told that Heol of Bethel, a native of Bethel, rebuilt Jericho, but that as he laid the foundation, his first son Abiram died. By the time he set up the gates of the city, his youngest son Sagub died as well. Jericho's curse is even recognised in this verse, saying the deaths of Heol's sons took place in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua. While the curse affected he who rebuilt the city, it never actually cursed the city itself, which is why after Jericho is rebuilt, nothing terrible happens to it. In fact, the city reappears again in the New Testament, where we see Jesus healing two blind men in Matthew 20:29, 20, Mark 10:46 and Luke 18.35. Jericho is featured again in Luke 19.1-3, where Jesus is noted as passing through and meeting Zacchaeus. We also see mention of Jericho in Luke 10.30, where we are told the Good Samaritan was travelling to Jericho from Jerusalem. But let me know in the comments below what you make of the curse that Joshua placed, and whether you enjoyed today's video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. As always guys, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next video. Until the next time guys.